Hello, everyone. We're going to get started here in just a few minutes, but thank you again for joining us for another C2C Care webinar. It looks like the room is filling up quickly, so we will go ahead and get started because we have quite a big program today. Let me share my slides. Okay, well, uh, welcome everyone for our final C2C Care webinar of 2024. You're here today for contamination and pesticide residues for small and mid-sized cultural institutions. We're gonna be running from about one to 2 p.m. Eastern. Um, and we are, we should be recording today's program. So if for some reason you have to dip out too early, no worries. We will be sure to post the recording in just a few days. My name is Robin Bauer Kilgo. I am the C2C Care Coordinator. Um, I am located just outside of Washington, D.C. in Silver Spring, Maryland. If you have any questions about the program, I do encourage you to reach out to my email, c2cc at culturalheritage.org. This is our home on the web, connecting to collections.org. I always like to shout it out in case we have some new viewers with us today. Um, C2C Care has been around for over 10 years now and is basically a wonderfully supported program by FAIC and IMLS that brings us one free webinar a month. Um, and then we also have a lot of really great resources related to uh, courses, which I'm going to talk about here in a little bit. The website also has a link to our moderated community. So if you have a question about collections care, direct collections care, you can actually log into the community, post a question. And then we have this fabulous group of volunteer monitors and experts who will get you some really good resources and ways to answer that question. Um, and we also have some curated resources on that website. So if you're interested in our program, past webinars, courses, anything like that, I encourage you to go to that website. C2C Care is actually has two places on social media right now where we announce programs and kind of what's happening in the community. One is on Facebook where our handle is at C2C Care. And our other one is on the AIC LinkedIn page. So if you're interested in finding out about upcoming announcements for our program, I encourage you to go check out those two places on social media. Quick technical review. Today we are using the fabulous platform known as Zoom Webinar. Uh, with that platform, there are actually two ways you can interact with our, our panelists today. Uh, one is via the chat box. The chat box is an excellent place to say hello, say maybe where you're from. That's always fun to see. Um, and you can talk about the weather. That also seems to be a popular subject in that chat box. Um, but I will kind of point out that when it comes to the chat box, it is there for just quick comments. We also have enabled a Q&A box, which is an excellent spot for you to ask questions of our, of our panelists today. Um, as you can see with the chat box, it's a little bit of stream of consciousness. So if you have a good question, uh, we don't want to lose it in there. So please put questions in the Q&A box and we'll get to as many as we can at the end of the presentations. I'll also note that, as I said before, we are recording today's presentation. So if you have to drop out, no problem. You'll be posting it in just a day or so on the AIC YouTube channel and the Connecting to, Collect Connecting to Collections website. And finally, um, we have enabled captioning for this program as well. So we have a real life captioner working diligently away. Um, and if you would like to use that service, please hit the CC button at the bottom. Quick upcoming programming notes. Uh, as I mentioned, we actually uh, do one free webinar a month for our program. So just like this one, you log into our website, you can register for it, you'll get notifications. Our first one for 2025 has already been scheduled. It's care of newspaper clippings. Um, lots of small and mid-care, mid-size institutions deal with newspaper clippings within their collections. So we actually have someone from the National Archives coming in to talk to us a little bit about care, how to store, all that kind of fun stuff with newspaper clippings. And our big announcement is that we are actually, just as of today, have opened up our first course for uh, 2025, which is today opened up for registration. This webinar today is actually a little bit of a preview of that course. Um, the course is all about contaminations and pesticides and cultural heritage collections. Many of the speakers you see today will be, re be doing this course. Um, our courses are a little bit more of an in-depth look at subjects where it's actually a series of five uh, meetings where you can come in and have real interactions with the presenters on the topic of contaminations and pesticides and cultural heritage collections. We just opened it up for registration today. We have our two course instructors on the line with us today. So during the Q&A period, if you have questions about that, you're able to ask them directly. Their names are Lisa Goldberg, 
who's conservator at Goldberg Preservation Services in Marilyn Poole, who's an objects conservator at the Sonoran Art Conservation Services. If you click on that QR code or if you scan it with your phone or that go to that website, you can look at the course, see what's involved and register for it today. And I'll also add that we have an early bird fee of $99 through January 1st, 2025. This is the only program that C2C Care actually charges for. That's part of our grant with IMLS, um, but we try to make it as reasonably as we can for everyone. So again, please take a look at that, scan that QR code and you can find out more about that course today. So we have a series of presenters today that we're very excited to hear from. I'm gonna stop sharing my screen really quick and introduce our first speaker for today and get her presentation ready. Her name is Nancy Odegaard. She's conservator professor, excuse me, conservator professor at Arizona State Museum. I'm gonna go ahead and get Nancy's webinar set up for everyone and we will see you as the session progress progresses today. So Nancy, feel free to start whenever you're ready. Mm -hmm. I'll start with that first slide. Hello, I'm Nancy Odegaard. I, as she said, I'm a retired conservator and professor at the University of Arizona. I'm a fellow of the AIC and I've worked with the pesticide residue issues since the start of my graduate education in conservation. I've worked at the Smithsonian, the Peabody Museum at Harvard and the Arizona State Museum, in addition to numerous consultations with museums, repositories and tribal communities throughout the country and abroad. I'd like to acknowledge the indigenous lands of Arizona and Tucson being the home to the Odom and Yaqui people. And I'll also uh, want to note that I'll be showing some images of taxidermy and medical conditions. As um, Robin said, this is an introductory webinar uh, that will be followed by the webinar course that will explore many of these issues um, further and um, provide more. So um, next slide. Uh, we know that some museum objects transferred to non-museum settings for loan or repatriation may be contaminated with pesticide residues. This occurs because museum staff don't know how their collections were treated in the past. Museum staff are unaware of potential human health dangers from pesticides. Museum records and items, histories are poor, non-existent or not researched. And tribal representatives often don't ask questions about pesticide residues or potential human health hazards. Other and often research and testing um, is not done or has not been done by museums because of inexperience or lack of equipment or supplies and limited knowledge of handling and disposal of toxins or an incomplete um, awareness. And finally, there may be some conflicting values and priorities both by the museum and by the tribe. Next. Next slide. Yeah. Um, so why were pesticides used in the first place? Well, to prevent damage by biodeterioration. Biodeterioration is the process that involves the combination of an organism, the pest, at the food source, in this case, the museum object, and um, a suitable environment, a quiet, dark, comfortable place, like much of museum storage. Insects like to eat protonaceous or cellulosic materials, and that's where we see most of the damage. Unprotected items that are made of these materials often become infested. Unprotected items of these materials with no sign of infestation probably have a poison. The image in here at the upper right shows a wool sash that was infested with clothes moths. In the 1980s, I was experimenting with freezing to control pests. I cut the sash into two pieces and froze the box on the left and sealed the identical box on the right. I placed it in a dark, quiet place and looked at it again a month later. What remains on the right is the consumed gray residue of the black and white yarns. It, infestation can be very damaging and very quick. Next slide. A little history may help us better understand the pesticide issue. Pesticides were used because museums were built to collect and preserve cultural collections in perpetuity. In the 1980s, many cons museum conservators became concerned with how pesticide treatments 
were altering the appearance of items. So some began compiling files for of pesticide information. In fact, my position as conservator at the Arizona State Museum originally required that I supervise a monthly pesticide treatment of the building. However, by the 1990s, many human health risks became better known and some museums began to consult with industrial hygienists. It's important to understand nobody wanted collections to be destroyed by pests. Um, those of you that maybe work with archaeological repositories that offer curation of federally owned collections know you should be following the Code of Federal Regulations, CFR 36 Part 79, which stipulated that collections should be cared for and maintained, and this might include pesticide treatments. Prior to NAGPRA, most collectors and museums never considered items would be returned back to their communities. NAGPRA required repositories to inform repatriation recipients of any presently known treatments, including pesticides. In 2000, Alice Adongi and I testified to the NAGPRA Review Committee that determining the hazard of NAG, hazard to NAGPRA objects or to persons handling potentially contaminated objects involved, had medical implica implications. And these determinations really could not be made without testing or sampling. It's important to know sampling is a form of analysis, and under the NAGPRA law, it requires tribal consultation, informed consent, and direct involvement by the tribes in this process. Next slide. And now there are penalties. Um, information um, through, let's see. Oh, and information... I'm sorry, I've got a, um, let me go. Um, so pesticides can be uh, placed into categories. Um, the list here includes um, some of the main categories that you can see, contact or dermal pesticides, desiccants, stomach, fumigants, residual, and persistent. I want to point out that this image um, indicates a range of pesticide products that I collected at the Arizona State Museum when I started working there in the mid 80s. These were just around the building. Next slide. Various pesticides may also be categorized by chemical type and further by their era of use. My experience has led me to consider highly toxic, persistent metal-based pesticides to be the most serious concern. Next slide. Now for museums to have any idea what pesticides might be associated with their collection, a history must be compiled. My experience um, must be compiled. At the Arizona State Museum, we received a NAGPRA grant and looked at a wide range of internal sources for information. The examples include um, the following on the list here. Information gathered through interviews was also helpful with long-term and retired staff. In fact, one former staff member were using, remembered using a white powder mixed in liquid on objects in a tent outside the museum building when he was a student in the 1950s. He didn't know what it was, but described it to me. And through testing, I determined it was arsenic he had been using. With pest control operators or extermination companies, I collected chemical names and dates of service, thus creating several drawers in a file cabinet. You can see the file cabinet drawers in the picture. Next slide. Other forms of pesticide evidence might include some of the following here that are actually uh, on or with the items in the collection. For example, the white powder on the feathers in the middle is arsenic. The dark color on the animal skull is mercury. And the white powder on the moccasin is DDT. The small bag, muslin bag, in the plastic box in the lower right is empty, but per purchase records and staff memory indicated that PDB or mothballs was used inside them like a sachet prior to 1977. Next slide. External information can also be helpful when beginning an institutional pesticide history. 
I want to share with you that the a second edition of the Old Poison New Problem Book will be coming out in 2025. I also have found that the free download book by the Environmental Protection Agency on pesticide poisonings to be helpful information. And if you work with archeological collections, you may find the 2019 volume of advances in archeological practice to be helpful for creating a pesticide history. And also a topic that will get further attention in subsequent, subsequent sessions of this course is the very new searchable database of museum pesticides on the museumpest.net site. This is an amazing resource. Next slide. Once one has an idea of the pesticides of concern, it's important to consider possible exposure and potential adverse health conditions. Just as the pesticides work to kill pests, they can harm humans. An exposure is defined as taking a toxic substance into the body through inhalation or breathing, indigestion by eating or drinking, or absorption entering through the skin. Exposure can also occur from items that were treated or have been cross-contaminated by contact with other items. Contaminants that are already present in a storage area environment can also be a problem. And using items treated through direct handling or as vessels for food or drink. Again, toxic metal pesticides are persistent, they stay strong, and they are the most medically hazardous. These uh, images are from chronic exposure to toxic metals. Next slide. I'd like to share some general information about safe handling of museum objects suspected of having pesticide residues. Preventing an exposure depends on recognition that there is uh, a risk and what that risk assessment is. Obviously, identification of hazards and people, evaluation of the extent of the risk, evaluation of existing control measures, determining, if you can, a risk rating, recording the findings, informing the parties, and monitoring and evaluating. Next slide, medical personnel will also be uh, considering aspects such as dose or amount of poison, the person's age, their general health, and the location um, when determining a medical risk. There are numerous rec recommendations for handling collections contaminated with poison. Unless you can confirm an object is safe, you should handle all objects carefully and consider they might be toxic. It is not advisable to place objects in opener, non-enclosed exhibit cases, to utilize objects in hands-on interpretive programs, to wear or perform objects, or to place them near food or other consumables. It is better to examine potentially contaminated objects in a well-ventilated working environment. You may want to use a fume hood for some. Next slide. Best to handle contaminated objects as little as possible. Try to use the stand, the box, or a storage container when handling. Ask about the use of personal protective equipment. And it, it is advisable to use some of these items. Next slide. Next slide. Um, always dispose and care for protective equipment properly after working with contaminated collections. Don't reuse disposable items. Always wash your hands that have handled objects before eating and drinking. And finally, report and document any health irregularities. To reemphasize personal protective equipment, gloves, try to remove them without skin contact. As shown in the picture, try to pull them in in between themselves and dispose of them and not use them again. Protective garments, launder them separately from personal clothing. The N95 respirators, in most cases you can dispose of them in the trash. 
Um, and remember, these are only for particles, not fumes. Fumes require special masks with cartridges. And goggles, these um, are not always needed, but when they are used, wash them thoroughly in warm water, rinse them in fresh water, and then clean them with disinfectant wipes. Next slide. Testing can be carried out by several means. Samples can be taken and sent to commercial labs, or sometimes to chemistry labs, or sometimes to conservation labs for analysis. Having worked with many chemical spot tests, I recommend that people doing these types of tests follow these follow uh, these suggested um, items. Um, wearing protective clothing, knowing your instructions, using fresh reagent, holding papers with tweezers, working well ventilated. Um, very important. Always work along with a known positive and a known negative control so you know that your procedure is correct and your reagents um, are correct. And make notes of your procedures and the results. Prepare for proper disposal and uh, maintain safety data sheets. These are just examples that are tests for a number of things that would be useful. Um, Remember, spot tests, though, can only determine the presence of a chemical, not the amount of it. They can provide a relatively inexpensive method, though, for screening a collection. And you'll hear more about swipe tests and spot tests later. Next slide. Increasingly common is the use of non-destructive portable XRFs, X-ray fluorescence spectrometers, for detecting inorganic pesticides they can provide some quantitative information. We began working with these instruments in the late 1990s, and with various instrument models, we have found that their capabilities have changed a lot over the years. Um, and by the way, um, many beautiful pigments are actually metal oxides and can be very toxic. The PXRF identifies elements and does not distinguish between pigments tanning agents or pesticides. So you have to, um, when using an XRF to determine for a po potential pesticide residue, you have to do calculations and to, calc um, to determine what's, what's useful. Basic practices suggest that you provide safety training for the instrument, you calibrate, use calibration samples, you develop and use testing protocols you go through a process of interpreting the spectra and data from these instruments and develop a medical risk calibration program and a containment strategies for items that are uh, contaminated. And if doing testing, complete and to deliver helpful reports to the recipients. We go through a process of determining dose and work with medical personnel to identify the human health risk. Next slide. Finally, perhaps, um, so when, when dealing with uh, possible pesticide contamination, be prepared. Develop clear labeling and handling procedures for your contaminated items. Practice good personal hygiene. Wear PPE. Maintain the safety data sheets dispose of hazardous materials properly, and seek professional advice and training. For medical or human health issues, we suggest you contact the American Industrial Hygiene Association and or the American Association of Poison Control Centers for help. Next slide. Finally, uh, perhaps the most important point I'd like to make concerns collaboration work as a team. We typically have a conservator, tribal member, chemist, industrial hygienist, or medical toxicologist on board. We select an appropriate testing program based on what information is needed and what is available. We investigate the human health hazard for the specific situation. For example, will the does the item need to be present but not handled? Will it be stored in a container, worn in a ceremony? And if so, where on the body? 
Will it be handled by children? Will it contain food? Will or will it be ritually disposed, possibly in the ground, in water, or by burning? We want to consider options for mitigation or reduction, remediation or reversal or full removal. And we want to enforce regulations to limit hum, human individual and environmental exposures with PPE. And here we can see working taxidermied item with children, items being worn, a vessel requested for use uh, with a, with a uh, liquid. This is spot testing, um, swipe testing, and um, containing a cross-contaminated object uh, in plastic with a label. And last slide. Um, I want to say one more thing. Um, at this time, please note, there are numerous possible methods of pesticide removal that have been explored and tested on objects. However, uh, the following actions must precede any removal um, effort involving pesticides. Again, coordinate your team, determine the probable pesticide presence through documentation and screening, identify the chemicals through qualitative and quantitative analytical techniques, and then assess the potential human health risk through toxicological evaluation. And with that, um, you may proceed. And thank you. Thank you, Nancy. We really appreciate you taking the time today to go through that. So I'm going to bring online our next presenter. His name is Lou, Lee Wayne Lome Yastaiwa, NAGPRA Coordinator, Hopi Cultural Preservation Office of the Hopi Tribe. Lee Wayne, I'm going to share your slides here in just a second. And okay. when you are ready to progress, just let me know. Okay, I'm ready. Well, good morning, everybody. My name's Lee Lomayastiwa. I am the Repatriation Coordinator, Research Assistant for the Hopi tribe, and I am Bear Clan from the village of Sungupabi. And one of my jobs is um, doing repatriation, and we work with over 300 museums throughout the United States to um, get a lot of our ceremonial items back. Okay, next. Uh, we live in uh, Northeastern Arizona, and we have a, a population of about 11,000 uh, people, Hopi, and our migration from Central America goes all the way up to the North, the Four Corner States. Next. <clears throat> When uh, this is a kind of like a history of uh, how we deal with um, our, you know, NAGPRA and the, the items that we have in the museums. In uh, 91, when the NAGPRA was passed, we started receiving information on Hopi items, human remains from all the museums and in 1995, we visited Harvard, and you know we have our uh, cultural resources advisory task team. Our elders are our advisors, and when we got into uh, Peabody Harvard, uh, they were told to wear gloves, uh, the the coats, lab coats, um, respirators and they were kind of puzzled and didn't why do we have to wear wear these you know um we came to see our cultural items and we want to touch them and um just stuff, stuff like that and that was one of the um e um things that they noticed that you know something was wrong so um they were told that you know these items were um being preserved by uh certain uh pesticides one of them being arsenic cyanide and so <clears throat> i think hopi was uh the first kind of 
tried to bring this issue up. So in 1997, the Cultural Preservation Office beginning um, with uh, NACPA grants to um, test uh, these items. Next slide. And Hopi objects are not only in the United States, but throughout the, the world and um, many objects have been identified in the United States for uh, repatriation and, um, you know, internationally. Repatriated items on Hopi reservations are either in protected storage or returned to appropriate individuals or communities. Today we have about 12, we have 12 villages and each village has um, different societies and a lot of the items that were taken from Hopi were uh, from these uh, societies and not a lot of people were, um, you know, initiated into these societies uh, to, um, you know, identify if they are Hopi or not. Objects are <clears throat> made of various types of mainly organic materials. Uh, th these are the ones that are subject to pesticide applications. So if they had like feather uh, fur on them, they were um, fumigated or cyberized and um, that's the ones that they have um, arsenic or the, uh, the pesticides on them. Some of these items, uh, you know, when we went to other museums, they were handled without um, proper notification of possible health risk during identification. So after that, you know, they were, we asked for repatriation of these items. And once we received them, we would take them to each village, which village that they came from. Next slide. Most of them were our uh, Hopi Kachinas, Kachina um, mask, and those are the ones that have, you know, it touches your uh, it's skin to skin contact. So um, a lot of these items we received and after we were notified that these um, ceremoni ceremonial items were preserved one way or another, you know, we had to go back to the to the villages where we already took them to and the Kachina priests, um, they were they got angry at us and said, why, why, why did you give them to us only to take them back? And after when we um, uh, brought them back into the office and then we um, had them tested and one uh, place where we had them uh, tested was at um, um, with uh, Nancy and uh, that was David, right? David and uh, and others. So um, our Katsina priest, Lawrence Kiva, and I at that time, um, we were down there uh, at um, U of A uh, testing the, the items. Next slide. <clears throat> this is how we uh, kind of, it's kind of like a protocol of how we handle artifacts when they return um, if they are brought in conjunction with a ceremony or cultural context, usually when we bring an item, they are brought into our, um, our kibas where the priests, they welcome them with cornmeal and, um, smoking of the Hopi tobacco. And, um, they say a few words after that, uh, welcoming them back to, to Hopi. And 
they are handled, you know, it's usually without um, gloves on. So um, the the people that we gave them to, they take them into storage. So we have um, homes or clan homes that uh, take and take them in, and it it's just like out in the open, open and um, probably next to a, a family home. <clears throat> Next, these are some of the um, homes that we usually bring them to. These are our Hopi homes and um, kivas and storage buildings. Once we bring them into the home and they're uh, welcomed and they're not put into the front, but there's little um, small rooms towards the rear of the, the home where they are, are kept. And usually that's the storage area where also they keep their corn, um, watermelons from their harvest. And they're, um, like it says on the storage buildings, they're the, near the food and clothing of uh, these individuals. Next. And, you know, once the elders, um, when they um found out about the pesticides on them you know they were concerned so this is kind of like how we told them that um it might affect them through their uh hair because usually they'll put some of the, the items on um through their eyes ears and skin and their nose and mouth so this is just kind of uh, an example of how we tell the elders or advisors that, you know, through these areas that they'll get uh, the contamination in their, in their system. Next. This is kind of like um, what I just talked about, the artifact returns home and it's brought to the home or to the kiva, and then people handle and touch the artifact. Usually they'll put cornmeal on it and they'll touch it and breathe air around it. And the participants use item, like I said, skin to um, the item's contact. Um, participant is contaminated and um, the participant sometimes don't really know that um, um, they might have other people that are exposed and they might get sick also. So um, that's what we uh, tell them now that they're, um, that's what will happen if they don't uh, clean these items or um, have them tested. Next. This is what we, uh, like I just said, if you receive items from private collectors, museums, or individuals, um, once we heard about the uh, pesticides on these items, we wrote to many of our 300 uh, museums that we deal with and asking them to um, send us uh, some kind of a history if they've been uh, preserved one way or another. So that's what we did with Aspo Records and History of the Care of the Item <clears throat> and that they contact the uh, Hopi regarding return of the items. And with the museums, a lot of items we've through uh, paper, we've um, already had them uh, repatriated legally, but with the contamination issue, we are letting them keep the item until there's a way to, um, we can find to take the, the, the pesticide off, but, um, I don't know. So there's a lot of museums that have Hopi items and they um, 
are keeping them for us yet until we find a way to um, test them or, or you know get them get the pesticide off. Okay, next. All right. Well, I like to uh, thank. This is kind of like our history of how we um, dealt with uh, the NACPRA issue. Thank you. Bye -bye. Thank you, Lee Wayne. We really appreciate it. Mm -hmm. So now I'm going to go ahead and bring online our next speaker. Her name is Kate Compton Gore. She's NAGPRA Training Coordinator at National NAGPRA Program. Kate, I'm going to go ahead and share your slides. Whoop, I lost them on the screen. Sorry. There we go. And feel free to start your presentation whenever you're ready. Thank you, Robin. Hi, everyone. I'm Kate Compton Gore. It's nice to see all of you here. My work focuses on the issue of contamination and the impacts of repatriation. Today, I will discuss my work that over the past few years has focused on this issue. The Native American Graves Protection and Repatriation Act, or NAGPRA, and the ongoing problem of contaminated collections. I realize that not everyone here works with NAGPRA. However, this information can be useful when working with all collections and not just those under NAGPRA. I won't spend too much time on the act itself, and I recommend you go to the National NAGPRA program website for more information and for clarification. NAGPRA is a federal law that was passed in 1990. It provides for the protection and return of Native American human remains, funerary items, sacred and ceremonial items, and items of cultural patrimony. By enacting NAGPRA, Congress acknowledged that ancestral human remains and cultural items removed from federal or tribal lands belong to Native American tribes and Native Hawaiian organizations. For clarity, museums and institutions may include repositories, universities, historical societies, federal agencies, medical examiners, and really any place where Native American ancestors and cultural items are held. NAGPRA impacts tribes, museums, and institutions. However, not all hold NAGPRA eligible collections. For more information on whether or not your collection falls under NAGPRA, I urge you to read the act and the regulations. Through consultation, we need to learn to listen to our tribal partners and learn to ask the appropriate questions. Next slide, please. Within NAGPRA is a requirement to report the presence of any known hazardous substances. Museums and institutions must report the presence of substances used to treat ancestral human remains and funerary items, sacred and ceremonial items, and items of cultural patrimony, if known. The act does not require additional research or time spent to identify possible hazards. And as I will discuss, this can become a problem. Next slide, please. When NAGPRA passed in 1990, early repatriation efforts between 1990 and 1995 encountered contaminated items, which resulted in the delay of some of these repatriations and asked how much harm is this causing and why was this not known about sooner? What should have been a form of restorative justice was described as another way to further the legacy of injustice to indigenous communities. After years of lobbying to include requirements on contamination, in December of 1995, regulations which provide instruction for the implementation of the act were published and they included this regulatory requirement to identify known hazards. Between 1995 and 2005, Work related to addressing contamination in collections resulted in numerous workshops, presentations, conversations, books, and literature. This work carefully addressed the problem and provided solutions, ways of consulting and collaborating, and recommended that all museums and institutions should go beyond only reporting what hazards were known and create a history of pesticide use and test when possible or necessary, and only with tribal consent. After 2005, there was a decrease in work related to contamination. I have identified this was due to several reasons, including the idea that museums and institutions would continue this work. There was a loss of institutional knowledge as staff retired and new NAGPRA professionals entered the workforce, and the issue of NAGPRA only requiring to report what was known. The updated NAGPRA regulations that were published in January of this year bring new focus to the issue but there is still a lot of work to be done. Next slide, please. Through my work, I have identified that NAGPRA is an environmental health issue and an indigenous environmental justice issue. Environmental health addresses how the world impacts our health with familiar examples, including lead poisoning, water quality, pollution, agricultural pesticides, and toxins in museums. 
it becomes an indigenous environmental justice issue when we address that contaminated items are often unable to be reused in ceremony, placed, or reburied, and can remain disconnected from their communities. Cross-contamination can be a problem, and the importance of including tribal perspectives and knowledge on spiritual poisoning, which will be different for each tribe and community, needs to also be addressed. Only through consultation and asking questions can we work through this. Next slide, please. My work has identified that very few museums and institutions have policy about contamination in NAGPRA. Very few have staff with expertise on the issue. Conservators are not always on staff and NAGPRA professionals are not required to have a background in collections care. There is not always evidence for contamination and therefore might mistakenly be thought that none is present. And minimal professional development has been available in the past. Next slide, please. We as professionals have an ethical and professional responsibility to understand everything we can about past pesticides. Through consultation, we can ask questions to help inform how a collection will return and the intended use. This will allow ancestors and items to return to communities. This work is not only about what we have to do, but what we should do. Thank you. Thank you, Kate. We appreciate you going through that. So now we're at our final presenter today. Her name is Melody McAdams. She, she is Senior Tribal Heritage Ma Manager, United Auburn Indian Community of the Auburn Rancheria. Melody, I'm going to go ahead and share your slides and feel free to start presenting whenever you're ready. Thank you. So contamination can act as a barrier to repatriation in many ways, including risk, lack of information, ambiguity interpreting information, and ambiguity answering questions about contamination. Typically, museums do not have information regarding potential contamination of ancestors or cultural items. This means that tribal repatriation practitioners are often conducting repatriation work without being informed about potential risks. Even when there is information, it often is not presented in a way that leads to safe repatriation. However, it's more helpful than no information at all. In the absence of knowledge, many repatriation practitioners interpret risk to mean that ethnographically recovered museum collections, such as basketry and regalia, do have substantial contamination risk and that it is not safe to repatriate. This has been a substantial barrier to the safe repatriation of basketry and regalia. However, archeologically recovered collections are often seen as relatively safe from contamination. So in Nancy Odegaard's presentation, you saw that example of, of pests chewing up that wool sash but archeologically recovered items were already removed from the ground. So typically any pests that would have chewed on them have already done so, so there wouldn't be a reason to apply those. That doesn't mean that they can't be affected by cross-contamination and other vectors. Um, so there has been and continues to be substantial repatriation of archeologically recovered tribal ancestors and cultural items. At our office, our first experience with contamination was unexpected. We were repatriating cultural items that were archeologically recovered. We were notified of the potential contamination when we were preparing for physical transfer and reburial. At that point, we made the decision to stop and ensure that we could safely repatriate without exposing people to unsafe contaminants and without contaminating the soil and groundwater at our planned reburial location. These two questions turned out to be very significant, so I'm going to repeat them. The first, how do we keep people safe during reburial preparation? And the second, can we safely rebury without contaminating groundwater and soil? I think that museums tend to approach contamination by trying to determine if it is present. This is a good first step, but tribes typically need more interpretation in order to actually repatriate. 
the museums that we were working with provided us with several binders of testing results and offered to do more testing. However, they couldn't answer these two questions. How do we stay safe during reburial preparation? And how do we rebury without contaminating the soil and water? Luckily, a colleague referred us to an industrial hygienist who had worked with tribal communities doing cleanup of toxic waste sites. He implemented our preferences for respectful protocol during this process. The industrial hygienist was able to use the existing data to answer our two questions. He identified very reasonable processes for worker safety. The contamination levels were also well within state standards for chemicals that were present. We were not going to contaminate the soil or groundwater with our reburial. A question and problem that first seemed insurmountable turned out to be easily resolved with the right people at the table. At first, it also seemed like the financial cost would be very high, but it also turned out to be reasonable. This experience improved our capacity to repatriate in a way that kept people and places safe while still being timely and respectful. However, it also made us realize that we need to be clear with our repatriation partners what our expectations and needs are. There are systemic changes that need to happen within museums and professional organizations in order to build capacity to address this issue. We need better contamination histories and processes for navigating contamination and repatriation. Next slide, please. As we navigated our way through our contamination concerns for additional repatriations, it quickly became apparent that while there is a lot of information regarding contamination, there is still much work that needs to be done in terms of building capacity so that tribes and museums experience the benefit of that knowledge in terms of a timely, respectful, and safe repatriation process. I reached out to colleagues at other tribes, museums, conservators, industrial hygienists, students, and other professionals to form a tribally-led working group. The goal of this working group is to try to build that capacity. We are very lucky that many of the original pioneers in the field of contamination from the early 90s are part of the working group, and so we are receiving the benefit of their knowledge and expertise. This webinar series which has been spearheaded by Lisa and Marilyn, is part of that effort to make knowledge about navigating the contamination process more accessible to tribal and museum repatriation practitioners so that we can build that capacity. This capacity needs to be developed at the level of the tribe, the museum, and other professional organizations. Both tribal and museum repatriation practitioners need more resources for education on how to identify and address contamination of ancestors and cultural items. We need clearer options for testing centers in terms of understanding what tests are available, what type of information they give you, what the costs of those tests are, and how to interpret them. Museum representatives, conservators, industrial hygienists, and others also need to be building their cultural competency so that they are working with tribes in a way that meets tribal needs but does not add additional barriers, danger, or trauma to the repatriation process. I think that it is especially important that these professionals learn to ask tribes what the tribal goals for repatriation and use are, as well as what the appropriate and respectful way is to accomplish those. Many tribes have strict guidelines about respectful treatment of cultural items and ancestors. It's important to understand these before testing so that the testing is done in a good and appropriate way. Next slide, please. One of the critical first steps for building capacity is for museums to be able to put together contamination histories for their institution for accessions or for objects. Our experience with contamination histories is that people approach them from the figuring out what's their perspective, but not from the using them perspective. So we see contamination histories 
that are non-existent. That's the first problem, not having them. Um, and the second problem is that we'll then get overly broad ones. So people will tell me to assume that it could be anything and everything. This is almost as unhelpful as the non-existent pesticide histories. It does convey risk, but it doesn't do much more than that. Um, or people will provide insufficient detail. Um, typically, these are just lists of all the contaminants that are present. It's not clear what we can do with that. If you give me a list of 50 chemicals, do I need to test for every one? Which ones are likely to be in my repatriation? Are any of them limited to certain years or types of objects? These contamination histories need to have additional information so that they can be interpreted in the context of repatriation. Next slide, please. So we need to build on contamination histories and data to create processes that let us use this data and information. While we had two questions, other tribal representatives may have different questions. I often think about it as a spectrum of outcomes. Sometimes the desired outcome may be physical reburial. For basketry or regalia, it may be a return to use within the community. Our experience is that industrial hygienists with competency in this field can often answer these questions, but they typically aren't incorporated into the process when it comes to tribal repatriations. We need more competency and capacity in terms of translating data to desired outcomes for tribes. Often this can be very straightforward, such as wear gloves or wash your hands. Sometimes the answers are more complicated, but we need to be able to interpret the data into paths to respectful and timely repatriation. Thank you, that concludes my presentation. Thank you, Melody. And thank you to all of our presenters today. That was some great information and it really gives you a good idea of uh, what we're planning on covering in the course next month. So um, I the Q&A box has been hopping this entire time. So I'm gonna refer everyone uh, here during our live program to please go take a look at that Q&A box because it has been quite exciting to kind of read and see the answers that have been going on in it throughout the entire session. Um, I'm also going to refer everyone to the chat box real quick because we have a link to uh, resources, which are all the presentations that we saw today, which are available for download, a link to the course that we've been referring to, and then a survey for this webinar because we always like to do our surveys for C2C care. Um, going back to the Q&A box, a lot of the questions that have been put in there are what are considered basically health and safety questions. Um, so again, I would refer folks to take a look at those Q the answered questions because we have a lot of expert advice in there. And I will also add that the course that we're doing is going to have an industrial hygienist as part of the course. So that would be a really good spot to kind of get into the down and dirty of some of these questions, because that's something that I know me as, as a registrar, as a trained registrar, I always feel like I'm trying to fill in health and safety information throughout my life because we never really had formalized courses. So I appreciate that. Um, we can stick around for about five minutes for some questions. So I wanted to take a quick look and see if we had some that could talk in general or even see if some of our panelists wanted to take a look at some of the answered questions and if they had any other thoughts on them. Um, I did like the one question of, what advice do you have for smaller institutions with tight budgets and limited bandwidth, right? Because C2C Care is here for small and mid-size. Um, for folks who are not affiliated with the university, who are not able to regularly work with a toxologist or chemist, what, what is their first step in trying to identify these pesticides? And I was hoping that each of our panelists could kind of give some words of advice to these types of folks, since that is our core audience. Um, Nancy, would you like to start and give some advice on what they should do or what they should be looking for? Sure. The first, the first step, though, is doing that internal search, um, asking former employees, going through records, looking at notes, coming up with a uh, figure out what, what's available there, looking at your collection and um, getting the beginning. Um, as far as then going further, you're talking about what you don't have. Look around for what you might have. The um, Each state has a poison control center. 
that is a free service. So you can make a call and ask perhaps for some information or guidance. The um, Industrial Hygiene Association that I mentioned, they have a working group that is actively wanting to work on this topic and can provide, uh, you might get a link where you could talk to somebody there. And then um, search the web. There's some articles that are uh, easily available on the web. And um, if you live in an area where there is a conservator, you can probably call a conservator that's working for a public institution and get some information. Uh, I know that when I was working at the museum, I got a lot of public calls on all kinds of things, but pesticides was one of them. So I would say if you if you can call a public museum, um, you should be able to talk to a public employee. <laughs> Perfect. To, Thank you. Appreciate that. Lee Wayne, do you have any advice for small and mid-sized institutions who want to start tackling this issue? Um, when we um, didn't have uh, these resources, we would uh, tap into the NACPA grants and the museums would apply for it, they would get it, and then we would um, send advisors to the to the museums and uh, they used the XRF. And then uh, the American um, Industrial Hygiene, uh, they have this little uh, kit that they're uh, making. Um, it's a swab test. So it'll be... Um, just uh, testing, I mean, if you take a swab, then it'll just read off what um, pesticide it was uh, um, sprayed with or cyberized with. So, or yeah, the, just that, those two, uh, if you get a grant through the XRF or the, um, the swab test. Perfect, thank you. Kate, do you uh -huh. have any advice to small and mid-sized institutions? Sure. Um, I actually work in a mid-sized, a medium-sized, and we don't have a conservator on staff, and we've only had one come in a few times over the years. Um, and really what Nancy just mentioned, there's so much information that you can find within your own institution um, and narrow it down from those over 100 possible pesticides and really understand what is around in your museum. Um, and so that's how we started, was creating a history so that we would have more information to be able to share with our tribal partners. Thank you. And then Melody, do you have any tips of advice? Yeah, I just want to say if you're looking at testing first, you are putting the cart before the horse and stop, put your swabs down. Um, there's a lot that should be done first. Um, if you start with testing, it's like writing a paper without outlining. You're just going to have to undo a lot of work. Um, so you really do need to kind of first start with with what a lot of these presenters has, have talked about with some of that basic information. I know one of the things that we did because we're a tribal office, but have a lot of the same concerns is just looked at setting up our workflow so that even if these issues are present, how are we minimizing our risk? Um, because that was a big one as well. And often that can be easily incorporated with traditionally appropriate and respectful handling. Um, so there's kind of a, a lot of things to unpack and to figure all of that stuff out and kind of what your issues and needs are and to let those drive your testing um, rather than to just start with testing because starting with testing like sends you into this testing spiral that's hard to get out of. Perfect. Thank you. Well, we are at time. So I want to say a huge thank you to all of our panelists today. Again, I put in the chat links to resources, the link to the course. Again, if you have some very specific questions to ask, I'm going to encourage you to go take a look at that course. Think about signing up for it. Um, we're going to be using Zoom meeting for that one. So you will have a one-on-one -on -one chance to talk to some of these folks. So I encourage you to go take a look at that. And lastly, our survey. Um, so again, thank you to our panelists. Thank you to IMLS and FAIC. Um, and I hope everyone has a really good holiday season, however you choose to celebrate. And we will see you all in 2025 for a new season of C2C Care. Thanks so much.